That's bullshit. That's bullshit. <laughs> well, hello, everyone. So that is my song that I started out with way back in 2015 when I started this podcast. So I want to greet you all and say, hi, my name is Sean Bradley. I'm the host of the ball shit podcast. I started ball shit in 2015 with the hopes of doing it with my friend locally, Luke Martin, but he lasted one show. So you can't really do much with a co-host unless they like live with you or something, or they're on the other side of the country or someplace where you can pipe into them directly. So excuse me while I say that, um, you know, I'm really not, not much on, uh, not much on on all that. So, all right, I'll get right to it. So here, this is why I bring you this today. So I could have done this a while ago, but why am I doing this now? I mean, most of you guys know who I am. You hear my story throughout every show. Why do you need another show about who is Sean Bradley? Like I'm somebody, okay? But somebody out there, I'm, I'm going to lovingly call him um, BJ my biggest fan. Okay. I'm going to call him BJ, my biggest fan. And it, this is heartfelt. This goes out to you for being solid and, and sending me a list of questions you'd like me to answer that I can't trust you with <laughs> in your own goddamn, in your own production. I can't trust you with. So what I'm going to do BJ today is I'm going to answer these questions for everyone so that they have it like completely unfiltered from me and I'm going to bring you right to it. Right. So, so let me bring this on screen. I'm going to share my screen here and this is going to be very informal. I'm not going to edit this at all. It's going to be in a complete monologue. So I'm going to take a couple breaks for a couple sips here and there. Okay. You have to excuse me because you know, I'm, I'm also going to be podcasting later on tonight. Um, so Hopefully you guys can listen to this uh, all in the meantime, right? So I've got to get this done and get this quickly, you know, so you guys can have it. So let me go ahead and share this screen up and, uh, and, and I'll get it, get it on its way. So let, let's just, wow, man, can I blow this up even more? Let me zoom in on this more. Let's, let's zoom in on this. Let's zoom in on this more. How do we, how do we zoom? Oh man, how do we zoom in more? Come on. Whatever. All right. Anyway, you can read it, right? You can go through it. Okay. So here it is. Good morning, Sean. Here's an outline of what I'd like to cover during I talk this Thursday night. If you have any questions or concerns, then please let me know so we can get on the same page before doing this. Intro. Just me on the screen talking for the first six to eight minutes. Once the intro song plays, then that's the sign I'm about to bring you on. That's great. Wonderful. Everybody's got an intro to a show, and I think that's wonderful. You get to announce your sponsors and stuff, and I hope you do your sponsors right because I would feel very bad if I did my sponsors again like I did back um, with Reptichip, for instance. I talked about it on What's in Your Cup yesterday with Brian. You know, yeah, I, I, I spoke out against BHP, and Reptichip was a sponsor, and he didn't like that, and, you know, I really didn't care what he had to say, and honestly, fuck, I lost him as a sponsor. So, you know what? I mean, I should have lost him as a sponsor, so – there you have it, right? That's that's it. That's what you get, right? So, um, oh, wait, let me tell you. Uh, nah, I'm going to leave it like it is. I was going to change my background. I'm going to leave it like it is. So here it is, right? Like you do your intro. I hope you do your guys right. But I know some of your sponsors might not be your sponsors anymore. But so anyway, who is Sean Bradley? Where are you from? I am from Louisiana, born and raised. I was born in a town called Metairie, Louisiana, which is a suburb of New Orleans. I lived in New Orleans the first two years of my life, lived in Metairie the next 11 years of my life, lived in on the North Shore of, uh, of New Orleans, north of Lake Pontchartrain, in a town called Mandeville for the remainder, and I'm 43 years old, okay? What year did I come into the hobby that's going to be the next question. Um, I started working. I, I, I got my first saltwater aquarium. My mother wouldn't let me have a snake. I got my first saltwater tank when I was, um, oh, there we go. Oh, wait, should I do that? Nah, let's do this. Uh, I got my first saltwater tank when I was, um, when I was simply 13 years old. I got it as a Christmas gift from my mom and my stepdad at the time. They would not allow me to have a snake. Uh, my cousin, uh, that's my, ne that's the next question. My cousin inspired me, but, um, my first inspiration, my cousin got me into the hobby. So they got me a saltwater tank. I nerd geek. 
fucking went out of sight, went crazy with the solar hobby and, uh, and progressed that into working at a pet store locally. And that was a small store. It was maybe 2,500 square feet. It was called Mr. Fish, uh, pets and supplies, but it was only fish and a few reptiles, no snakes. They weren't allowed to have snakes by their landlord, but they had iguanas and some things. I only really remember iguanas, but they had ferrets and some uh, hamsters and shit, but mostly it was salt water and fresh water. And I was mostly hired to do salt water because that was what I knew, you know, it's that creaking ass door, man. Don't shut that door when you go back through it, please. Or shut my door a minute. Um, yeah, creaky door. It was like Halloween in this re recording for a minute because I'm trying to go straight. So uh, back to it. Mr. Fish. Um, so it was a small store. They expanded it to a very, very large store, huge store. And at that time, I was kind of geeking out on reptiles, but I didn't have one yet. I begged my mom and stepdad after having the saltwater tanks and the job being so responsible. I was 15 years old. I'd already been working for over a year. They allowed me to have my first snake. So I'd been to my first reptile show when I was 13. I had been through a bunch of reptile stuff with my cousin, Mark. Uh, but ultimately, I guess I entered the industry when I was between 13 to 15, um, when I started working Mr. Fish in the store and I started working more with reptiles in the shop and then work with them more at home. What was my inspiration behind it? My inspiration was my cousin, Mark. He's 13 years older than me. I grew up looking at all of the snakes on the wall of his shotgun double apartment in New Orleans, um, he had a whole wall built out. He had rattlesnakes. He had some rhino. He had a rhino viper at one time. I remember uh, there was a pet store in New Orleans called Ott's Pet Shop. It was on Magazine Street. It was open since like the 1940s. It was very probably the first pet store. It was opened in New Orleans. Old man Ott opened it up. Um, and and <clears throat> ultimately, here, I'll just shrink it up when I'm doing the different shows. Ultimately, when old man Ott would run it, it was a very crazy show, a very crazy uh, shop because it was back in the day when he kept water turtles in a refrigerator and you could open the fridge and pick your own turtle out of the fridge. And he kept them at fuck like 50, 60 degree. It wasn't as cold as the regular fridge, but 50 to 60 degrees in the fridge. And that way you would see like the things would be in hibernation, but that's the way they did it in like the fifties and the sixties and the pet stores and stuff. But it was old school. And uh, when he died, his wife had the shop. She hired a friend of ours. His name was Robbie. And Robbie ran the reptiles upstairs. And upstairs, it was a little landing. Honestly, I, the room I'm sitting in is about 12 by 12. It, it couldn't have been much bigger than this room that was their reptile, reptile room. Okay. And it was jammed with like tubs with lids on them with heat tape strung around them and some cages shoved around, but there was no commercial rack systems available like there are today. This would have been in 1993 to 1995. Okay. It wasn't nearly the availability of this stuff. I remember seeing my first Dumerals boa there in that room, in that upstairs loft of the pet store overlooking the fish section. I remember seeing my first Dumerals boa there when I was 13 and it was like $850 and they went down to like 50 bucks. Now they're back up to like 700 bucks, but they were, they went all the way down to like nothing. Right. Okay. So, uh, so basically then we go, we go on with the, <laughs> we go on with the next step is, uh, the inspiration behind it. Whenever my cousin Mark and I, he was like, let's go to a reptile show. The very first real reptile show we went to, not the little feed store show that I talk about on bullshit sometimes, but the very first show that we ever went to was in Orlando, Florida. And that's what's now known as the Daytona beach show, uh, which is run by Wayne Hill. And it was always run by Wayne Hill. The very first show was done in Orlando in 1989. You can give credit to Brian Barshak. He was there. I don't think he was a vendor. Mark Bell was a vendor. There was quite a few people that I know that uh, maybe nerd Kevin McCurley, he might've been a vendor. I'm not sure. There are quite a few people that were vendors at that show in 1989. I didn't go there until 1995 when I was 15. I had my learner's permit. I could help my cousin drive the trip. We would leave my home in Mandeville, Louisiana, and we would go directly to, uh, oops, I'm sorry, guys. We would go, We would, I would leave my home in Mandeville and we would go directly to, uh, to to orlando okay so we would leave at midnight we would drive nine and a half hours uh you know not like what eight hours to i to ocala or wherever takes south to 75 or whatever it is south to orlando and we would be there at about nine and a half hours i remember it being like 615 miles from my driveway to our hotel at the radisson twin towers 
across the street from the old opening to uh, Universal Studios. That was the original location of the Orlando show. It was a Holiday Inn, a Radisson Twin Towers, and what? Like a fucking Denny's or something like that? It was nothing, really. It was something stupid. It was like a Denny's or some shit like that, right? So, my look, my phone is blowing up today over this BJ shit. Look at the back of my phone, my Hurricane Reefer. It's all green, so the green screen gets it. But Pangea, we're going to have him on the podcast soon, Pangea. Let's get back to Sean Bradley. Who is Sean Bradley? Hmm. Who am I? Look, I'm all over the fucking place. I'm branded, bitch. That's who I am. <laughs> Whatever. Apparently, I'm a baby. I'm a I'm a six year old baby girl. Apparently. Anyway, all right. Uh, that was the inspiration behind it, right? Robbie, the the Ott's pet shop, the crazy snakes that we saw upstairs. All that kind of shit. That was always great. That was always a wonderful thing, right? Okay, so the next question was, who were some of your first mentors, all right? Who were some of your first mentors? Honestly, my first mentor would have probably been, um, probably been the guy I worked for in Wild Cargo Pets. And if, if, if BJ, the, the fanboy, was, uh, was, was more informed by listening to the old ball shits, like a lot of, I know you guys are, a lot of you are, you remember the episode called Mentors, where I talked about the two guys that I watched fuck up that taught me the most. All right, and that was before I really fucked up hard, and I really, I still don't really think I fucked up all that hard. But anyway, my first mentor would have probably been Mike Luxinger, who ran that store and kind of ran that store down into the ground, making it his own dream and kind of tailoring it his way, and not really taking into consideration the client base and and the area, the demographic, and what it could deliver. Maybe I'm guilty of that later with my own fish store, admi- uh, you know, aspirations. But we we shall see later on in this expert explanation. So other mentor would have been Brian Barchak. I mean, BHB would have been huge, right? Cause he was a big colubrid breeder. I got into the snakes heavy with boas and, uh, and Tom Crutchfield sent out a gorgeous boa because of Ott's pet shop. And my very first snake was a boa. That was what I wanted to say. My very first snake was a boa. Right. And, uh, and, and I got it from Ott's and I wanted a Suriname red tail and they all kept asking me, do you want a weird looking one? Or do you want one that looks like one in a book? And I was like, I think I want one that looks like it's in a book, right? Because I had been studying all these books. I had already had the Ross and Mars Zek, this book right here. I'd already had this priceless gem right here. Sorry, the green screen throws it a little bit. The Reproductive Husbandry of Pythons and Bows. If you can buy this book, used old book, buy this book and cherish it forever. This book is amazing. I wish I had another copy that was in a fire safe just in case uh, something happened because this book is truly a treasure. Uh, I highly recommend it. I read it all through high school, uh, front to back, cover to cover, and uh, learned so much, you know, in the 90s from that book right there. Uh, it's absolutely, absolutely tremendous. So that would also be one of my first mentors, right? Books. Books were my first mentors. Those were my first mentors. Uh, people that I happen to call friends now, uh, that Dave and Tracy Barker, this book, Pythons of the World, Australia, uh, came out in, 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 in what year? In. 1994. I got this book when it came out in like the year after it came out. I got it in 95. It's not signed or anything, but it is my original floppy copy from back then. And I, again, I cherish this book as a great book. It's, it's such a culmination of many years of many breeders, not just the Barkers, but many breeders that they interviewed that did the, uh, that did the surveys for the species in this book. If you're interested in Australian pythons, this book is an actual, actual authority uh, as is that other book that I just showed you previously. So those would have been some major mentors into my previous career all right so uh now uh bj's questions move into um ball pythons and all of that type of stuff uh let's get into that what were some of your first mentors uh now the next question is first ball python investment my first ball python investment i i i I talked to my cousin and mark and i were doing the doing the store and stuff we were he was helping me out we were working a lot together we were traveling i started exotics by nature in 2000 in the year 2000 and I, bj didn't really ask me anything about that uh, ultimately what happened was that um my boss uh kind of drove wild cargo pets the store i worked for after mr fish my boss drove it into the ground and uh, relocated it to a new spot 
in uh, in Covington, Louisiana, and I he had a lease on it. He had uh, a lien on him for the power. He had a lien on him for the phone bill and all this. He was he owed money, and uh, I was able to buy the store from him for very little. I basically paid off his debt to the power and phone company. And I took his phone number. Best investment I ever made was asking him, if you're going to throw this phone number away, can I have it as part of me bailing you out of your debts? And he agreed to let me have it. And that was probably it for me. If I had to say my number one thing in life of success was a phone that was already ringing for a business that might have had something to do with mine. I mean, we sold dog food, cat food, bird food hamster food like we sold it all in this tiny little bitty store he had tons of inventory like a local pet store like hobby shop stop sadly enough mike was a brilliant guy i want to say this post the mentors episode where i kind of tr probably trashed him a bit for being a bad influence like being a bad businessman he really wasn't a bad businessman he was just 20 years early like we started the, a website called herpexchange.com in 1999 under his roof. That was exactly like Morph Market in 99. If you could imagine a database-like system that was rich with the ability to populate with your animals and your, your inventory and all this type of stuff. If you could imagine all of that all rolled into, you know, into it. It was absolutely a, a, an amazing idea, and it did not fly. If you dig out old Reptiles magazines from probably the summer of 99 to the end of 99, you'll find an ad in there for herpexchange.com, and that was Mike Luxinger and Sean Bradley and our efforts to try to bring you guys a website that was – that was our time machine from the future of John Lehman and Morph Market of 2015, 2020, 2023 – uh, to now the, to the now, uh, uh, to the now from the now of more of market of 2023 to the past of 1999 and herp exchange.com. I mean, I can't believe that like I have all of these wonderful things that I can say about my past here. And that I think is absolutely stunning, uh, to, to be able to recollect all of these fun things we've done. I don't care about whether it failed or not. Like it failed, bro. It failed. Like it fucking, it was his money. It wasn't my money. I had some time invested in it and uh, photography and stuff like that. It was nothing right for me, but he was my boss and he saw, he lost a lot of money, bro. He lost like probably 10 or 15 grand in that website deal over the, over the course of hosting it, having it developed. Cause it was a database. I mean, it was serious. Okay. But I mean, it, it really sucked to have, to have lost that idea, but that was really that was really sad, but that was in 1999. Uh, actually, I met Robin Markland at that show. Robin Markland was my next door neighbor. Robin from Redline Shipping. Robin from Redline Science. Uh, Ship your reptiles, Pro Exotics. Pr before all that shit, but Pro Exotics. Uh, Robin was my neighbor at that show, and I feel that BJ might have had a question about Robin in my show because I didn't support um, Redline fully in my announcement of shippers, right? I mean, on the show, I did it very honestly on Doug Knacker's episode. I announced uh, reptiles to you as a sponsor for the ball Ship podcast. And I wanted to be sure that nobody really got, you know, could interject on, on that. Um, you know, nobody could really, I'm sorry, let me unplug that. Nobody could really, uh, say I was saying bad stuff about Robin necessarily. I have some disagreements with uh, some other investors in the, in the group. That's all. I mean, it was nothing but other, but, but that, but it's not like anything was really serious. So I did meet Robin Markland at that show in 99 when we were next to him back to the, back on track. Uh, and the, 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 that brings me on to answer this question about ball pythons. But I started after that year in 99, I started exotics by nature by taking over wild cargo pets turning it into exotics by nature, taking out all of everything except for reptiles only in the store and building a big push towards local business. I owned a retail store with glass doors next to a fucking frozen yogurt shop across the street from a Sonic drive-in uh, fast food joint uh, down the street from like maybe four blocks from a hot, from our major hospital in the area. I had an exotics by nature, had a retail store. I was 20 years old and I ran that store in that location for two years before moving it to a warehouse location in Goodby, which isn't far. It's outside of Covington. It's maybe 
10 miles, 12 miles from my old location, but it's in a warehouse where I could build other rooms and double deck it and put incubator rooms and mouse rooms and do all kinds of shit. I rented in this warehouse in 2002. And in that point, I had started to invest in ball pythons the year prior when I was in my aquarium. I mean, when I was in my reptile store, when I was in exotics by nature, from the year 2000 to the year 2001, I was developing the retail and then it got kind of stale. I started breeding some stuff for the store. My cousin told me, dude, albino balls were 9,500. Then they were 7,500. Then they were five grand for like five years. Why? And I'm like, I, dude, people want them. They're buying them. He's like, it's a fucking ball python. I know, man, don't we don't we hate ball python? Fucking ball pythons suck. And I'm like, I know green iguanas and ball pythons suck. Come to now find out that I'd make all my life's money with green iguanas and ball pythons. Ooh, that was the day. He said, if my Peruvian red tail boa has babies this time, do you want to sell them and use the money to buy an albino? I said, yeah. So I jumped the gun. And I sold some stuff and I bought a hypo male. I bought a hypo pair from Frank Memo, who was a guy who was doing websites back then. He was Pete Call and Ralph Davis's first website designer. I bought a pair of hypo ball pythons, ghosts, orange, butterscotch ghosts, whatever you want to call them back then, uh, from Frank. And... That was no, that was no problem at all. Got him in, got him in FedEx or whatever. And I was like, oh no, you really going to send him FedEx? I didn't know. Like, you're not going to send him by the airport. Cause that's all we were shipping back then was, uh, was Delta dash and all that type of stuff. Right. So I couldn't really do that. So he shipped him FedEx or UPS one of the two. And it got so cold. Cause he used a little, I used a uh, uh, hand warmer packs. He just wasn't experienced in shipping and the female died. And I was left with a male hypo. Actually, if you look in Tracy Barker's book here, her second book, The Ball Pythons of the World or whatever book, if you look in this book, there is a page. The hypo page is in this book. Um, if you find the hypo page, it is uh, it is in here. If you have this book in your repertoire of books, if you don't, uh, ask for it for next Christmas. Somebody might give it to you because for a coffee table reference, and it very well might be dated. If that is your opinion, it very well might be dated. But at that point, do you really care? Because it's there's so much history of ball pythons in this book. Okay. Oddly enough, you go to the roped section where the binding rope is. <laughs> it's on the page after the binding rope. Page 89, and my very first hypo ball python, my very first morph I ever bought in my life is right here. Hypo melanistic. It says EBN lineage. I did not tell her to write that. That was an inside joke because she uses ghost. She would always say ghost, 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 ghost everywhere. She would say ghost. And I would say it's not ghost, it's hypo. What happens when someone makes an azanthic hypo and they want to call it a ghost? What are they going to call it? A fucking true ghost? Unbeknownst to me, I didn't name it. It's just common sense, right? I didn't name a true ghost a true ghost, but it's common fucking sense that it'd be called that. Just noticed that Iguana put a big claw mark in my uh, microphone. There you go. I turned it. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, that was it. That was the first ball Python investment was hypos from Frank memo and then followed very shortly by an albino. And that was it until I moved out of that store. And when I moved out of that store is when, uh, is when I really started to hit when I moved out of that store, uh, he, the next question BJ asked was what did you do with the money you were making back then? Well, what I did with the money I was making back then was I just spent it on more shit, okay? And I grew a business and I grew a business. I'm going to remind you all, I started this with a $20,000 gift loan, whatever you want to call it, from my mom. Uh, I didn't pay it back. I haven't paid it back. It's still on the IOU sheet. It's still coming off the taxes as I owe her. I mean, it was legitimately taxable income. 
that I do owe her back. I mean, there's no, there's no limit to that loan and how long I can pay it uh, or how long I can carry its loss. But at the same time, like it is, a, it was a loan of $20,000 that I started my entire life with. And that's pretty much what I've bounced off of the entire time. So uh, I, I maxed out credit cards, bro. I had another friend in Mississippi who was a rodent breeder who was supplying most of the industry around here with rodents, most of the pet industry. He came to me and he said he also wanted to invest in ball pythons, but he was concerned with the stores in the area and thinking because he had just raised his prices. After like 10 fucking years of having the same prices on his rodents, he had just raised his prices for the very first time. And he was upset, or some stores were upset, because he had expanded his house, he had renovated his house, and he, and they said shit. Oh, I see why you're raising the price, but you're raising the price because you just renovated your house. And he came to me and he was like, look, dude, I can't tell these people I invested in ball pythons. They're all assholes. They're all going to tell me I raised the price of rats so I could buy snakes, buy pretty snakes. And I'm like, yeah, they will. I know they will. I know them all. (laughs) Yeah, they definitely will. And I was like, so I'll buy them with you. You buy some and I'll buy some. And we'll say they're all mine together. Okay. And he's like, okay. And then, and you'll do the breeding. And I'll do the hatching or whatever, and I'll do the sell, you know, EBN will do the selling, and we agreed on a percentage. Now, my ex fiance was involved back then, and, and uh, you know, everything was pretty straight. But of course, when you do business on that level with anyone, and you're buying and reselling, and you're wholesaling, and you're making a profit, and you're doing it for a percentage, there's always a question of are you dipping in more? Are you lying to me about what you're selling it for? And ultimately that anger came up and that demon kind of sat on his shoulder. And I think it bit us in the ass. I'm sorry that it bit us in the ass because it was a very good relationship. It was extremely fruitful. And I definitely had my part in any wrong goings there at the very end of it. But uh, because we got into fights and stuff at the end when it was completely separated and all that type of stuff. But at that point, uh, I think feelings were hurt and, He's very old fashioned. He's an older guy, a much older guy, right? I was a child when he was a man. So now he's an older man and and I'm an older man. So I can appreciate him for who and what he is now and more or less say, uh, I'm really sorry how things went with that, but business is business. And sometimes people get hurt in the process. I'm sorry it hurt our relationship. He was always somebody I looked up to as a kid. I still appreciate him and his family values today. I see him at every local reptile show that I do. I never say anything negative about his animals or his care or anything about like that. I do wish we were still friends and family, but I do understand why we're not. All right. So moving on to that, like, so what did I do with the money I was making back then? I told you, right? I reinvested. Reinvest in anything else? No, I didn't reinvest in anything else. Not until, uh, not until, here's the next question, reinvest in anything else. Not until um, uh, I wanted to buy this place that I'm in right here. Celia and I were tired of renting. We rented, uh, we rented the warehouse for nine years. I rented the strip mall for two years. So 11 years of rent, I did the math. I'd given away $147,000 in rent. And I was like, holy fuck, we could own something. Why are we doing this still? If we're going to be breeders and we're going to be small, like we're going to be selling shit online. We're not going to be like, go, we're going to be going to shows. We're not going to need people walking in and out of this place. Why the fuck are we in here? Why are we renting Let's go find a place in the country. So we came a little further north, not very far north. Celia and I came up here to Folsom, which is only seven miles north of my old location. So if you find my old warehouse location, seven miles straight up the same street is my driveway. Practically. It's so close to the old place. Tim Bailey from Bailey and Bailey reptiles is actually just a mile uh, that way, a mile over my left shoulder um, off over the woods. And really, I mean, he started with me and he and I got started together was a best friend. Probably I'm going to answer that question here in a bit. Probably my very, very, very worst mistake that I ever made that I wish I could take back. And I wish I could apologize for, but again, damage is done, right? Damage is done. Uh, and hurt feelings last man. Hurt feelings don't go away easy. They they stick around, man. They, some of them stick around for generations but not mine not anymore not anymore fucking life's too short for that kind of shit so reinvest in anything else yeah when celia and i were working and churning and burning 
she invested in a car because she wanted something fancy. So I built her a, in 2007, I went and bought and it came in on my motherfucking birthday. I believe if I'm not mistaken in 2007, was it 2006? No, 2007. It was an 07. I'm pretty sure. October 24th, 07, my birthday. I was at a BMW dealership signing a loan agreement for her Mini Cooper. But her Mini Cooper was soon to be badass. And six months later, I well, I asked her what she always wanted. She said she always wanted a car that was unique to her. And so we built the car. I say we built the car because she made a lot of the decisions on the car. And she did help me do a bunch of the work on the car. I did a lot. But she also did a bunch of work in the business to keep feeding the car parts. So we burned up a ton of money on that fucking car. All right. But built the show car. I mean, fuck. The car was 35K brand new or 30, 30. Yeah, it was 35K brand new to car. And then I think she bought 19K in parts or whatever. So, of course, at the very next Mini in the Mountains, that was her dream. She said, I've done all this stuff with Pro Constrictors. She's published. There's books like Designer Morphs from John Barry. Boa Constrictor stuff from um, Vin Russo. If you see anything credited, uh, the Ball Python book from Tracy Barker, uh, uh, Nerds book, Nerds uh, Ball Python book. If you see any credits to an Asian girl named Celia, C-E-L-I-A, Chen, C-H-I-E-N, that was my ex. And my, sadly, my most recent, my kid's mom, and turned her against me. True story. I, I totally... I'm innocent in that one. Absolutely. And you're going to hear a lot of that. Man, he seems like he's innocent in everything. No, I'm not innocent in everything. But in some of these cases, I'm absolutely just like easily, easily framed for being that level of an asshole. Uh, just because I am that level of an asshole, perhaps. Okay. So here we are 32 minutes in. I've probably admitted to it plenty enough times, but I am definitely that level of asshole. So after the car went to Minnie in the mountains to win best in show. And it did went to Minnie in the mountains and it did win best in show. It was the best in show. Many of the biggest mini show, mini only show. It went against 50. There was a hundred minis in the thing, but I think only 60 minis or 58 minis got judged because the other ones were just silly sticker minis and stuff that knew they wouldn't win. So they didn't even care about the judges time. They bowed out of judging. You could be in the show, but not judge. Yeah, you know, it's Mini Coopers. <laughs> Let's be honest. It's not, it's not fucking Mini Trucks, okay? If it was Mini Trucks, shit would be real different. But I did get 10s across the board, and we did win Best in Show by a long, by a landslide. The entire car was custom, but I did bust my ass on it for almost eight months before it went in. So that was a big investment. But, man, it was a joy. It was always something I wanted to do. Didn't you all want to do it? Oh, men out there, at least, and some women want to go out and build a car from scratch, buy the parts you wanted, put them on, take them off, buy the wheels you liked and be like, hmm, I don't really like those. Let's sell those and get another set, you know, and just not give a fuck about how you spent the money. That's how that mini Cooper was. We busted our asses making ball pythons and boa constrictors our life. And we spent it playing like that. We didn't play hard. We didn't do drugs. We didn't do anything like that. We did do some frivolous sexual shit. I'll be honest. We were swingers for a couple of years and there's a few people in the industry that know about that. And now everybody in the industry knows about that. But at the same time, I mean, Hey, who, what is this without a little juice of who the fuck is Sean Bradley? Eh? you know, I mean, it's not like I'm not like I'm covering up the dirt. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, I didn't release any dick pics. I'm not that guy. Nobody ever hacked my phone, but if they did, whoo, that dude up in Michigan would be shame of himself. <laughs> I'll have a little fun on my own on this one. And maybe somebody might disagree, but here we go again. What's this next shit all about? All right. So let's move on. Reinvest in anything else. That's it, dude. Do I need a portfolio really to tell you that I've loved my life and what I've done? No, I don't fucking need that shit. All right. The ball Python market compare how things are from now, from back then. Honestly, I don't really know how things are now from back then. I'll be straight with you. There's more brotherhood now, a lot more, a lot more camaraderie. But is it real or is it because there was a lot of money in the market? Okay, so like if I bring you back, if I bring you back to the competitive days, the early days, the down and dirty days, right? The all or nothing days, yeah? The, uh, the really all or nothing days. Like when you had less than 20 people on earth 
with an with a morph for sale. Okay, with a single gene morph for sale. And the zeros behind it were several. Okay. And now having said that, what do you get when you throw a lot of money? Grown men, colored worms. Fucking chaos. That's what you get. You get chaos. You get one guy saying, yeah, 10 grand sounds good to me. And meanwhile, he's over there being like seven. I'll sell them to you for seven. I don't need, I don't need no more than seven. My mortgage is due. I'm buying more property. I'm building a new building. And everybody was selling something for sale for a land deal. Right now, it's a great deal because there's a recession. Buy while it's hot. Buy low, sell high. Buy low, sell high. Now's the time to buy. Eh. Yeah, sure, dude. All There's never a bad time to buy. You're growing your inventory to breeders, guys. You, the, the best time to buy was yesterday. Best advice I could give you. The best time to buy is yesterday. You're too late. You're already too late. And that's what the feeling was, right? Oh, I'm too late. I'm too late to produce. Oh, Camelon reptiles produce Mojaves before me. They have them for 9,000, but mine are only 6,500 because they're smaller. Yeah, dude, fuck you. That's how the prices went. Boof, boof, boof. That's how ball pythons didn't stay a commodity and didn't stay up. But why? Because that's not how this game works. This game doesn't stay high. It doesn't. It doesn't stay up. Whoever said you're going to buy something that stays up, right? I want to buy, I'm in the market for a new TV, 75 inches. I'd love an 8K, right? But it's like five grand for the 8K. It's like four or five grand for the 8K. I lost over three grand in crypto today. <laughs> I bet on the wrong horse today. I was, the thing is I bet and I did good, good, good. And I kept going and I knew I should have stopped. And I was a degenerate gambler with crypto and I kept being a degen and I degen in a little too hard. And I D I got my fucking degen dick chopped off. But anyway, that's for another show. We talked to Cedric, the song, uh, how are you say his name? We'll talk about crypto and, and NFTs and stuff one day, but yeah, dude, I got my ass handed to me, handed to me. Okay. So you know what? Back then, money would grow on trees. Not really. You had to fight for your dollar. You had a guy out there telling everybody, if Sean quotes you this much, I'll beat it by this much. And you're like, fuck, how do you get ahead? So it was a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Like I said, the the the, the glory days, the, the bad days, the glory days, the bloody days, the all-or-nothing days, right? The, the, the wide-out days. You guys don't know nothing about that. So that's different. I would say that's lovely because you have this chest bumping brotherhood of podcast people and things. Well, some of us, you know, most of us are friendly. And I would say that's probably one of the bigger disadvantages is the people that feel the need to cut each other down on their efforts and stuff when you're all basically trying to do the same thing, which I think is fucking crazy. So, yeah. So let's move on to this. So there's always let's get to move into more of a, his, the, the, the BJ questions. What advantages are there now, but also disadvantages? The, the advantages now is this communication, being able to YouTube stream yard yourself, promote yourself, show your stuff, Instagram stories on your phone have, you know, have come so far to where you can get people totally eating your shit out of your hand. You know, they're over here just fucking fawning over every word that you say and everything is absolutely, you know, uh, yeah, that's just how that is. I'm working. Look at all these texts, man. I'm like these textures grr, 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 all day grr, over this BJ shit, over this ball, over this fucking bullshit, over who is Sean Bradley. And I'm giving it to you guys right now. I'm giving you who is Sean fucking Bradley right fucking now. What advantages are there? No, also disadvantages. Disadvantages are this. <laughs> advantages are this. Disadvantages. Disadvantages are this. Okay. Disadvantages are this in that you better stay in your fucking lane. You better keep on your fucking game. You better be sharp, son. You better be ready. And you better always be respectful, cordial. Lead with example. Ooh. And I think these things are missed, you know? Everybody wants to know what a good BJ needs. BJ, A good BJ needs these three things. You know, a good BJ doesn't need to reach around, doesn't need some extra fist. It just needs these three things, right? It needs to be kind, it needs to be cordial, be humble, 
That's what it needs. These three things, right? Three things that I lost in 2018. Sure as fuck did. All right. Is it oversaturated was his next question. You know, and it, when I said disadvantages being this, being that you can run your fucking mouth and you can ruin your fucking brand. And I think that's plainly obvious this fucking week. I'm not ruining my brand. All right. Is it oversaturated? Um, No, it's not oversaturated because a bunch of you guys are still making money. It'll be oversaturated when the whole fucking thing falls apart. That's when I'll say it's oversaturated. The next question. Do you believe the recession talk? Absolutely. I believe the recession talk. You don't want me to pull up a Bitcoin chart. I've already done that on the podcast to show you what the fucking human emotion looks like. It looks like this. I spent a lot of money in 2019 or 2018. Oh, this works. 2019. Oh, this works. You know? Oh, that's basically what I did. That's basically how I came up with it. Look, we'll even do it. We'll go to trading view. We'll go to tradingview.com. We'll bounce over here. We'll go to uh, Bitcoin. Check it out. It'll be, it'll be entertainment for you. Chart. Nobody gives a fuck, but I'm going to show you ball pythons. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. Let's look at it on the daily, on the daily Bitcoin on the daily, since it was recorded on trading view in June of 2000 or no, that's July of 21. So that's, oh, that's soul. I'm sorry. Bitcoin. Here we go. Here we go. Bitcoin. Dinosaur. Here we go. Uh, Thursday, October 17. So October 17 is the last time this was charted. So look, that was indicative. That's not a bad ind indication, right? And you had like, so that's 17. Let's just goof a little bit and let's just scrap this timeline at the bottom. Let's just look at this thing as a whole. All right. Let's say you're at, man, let's say this is ahead of the scheme a little bit. 17, 18. I say this is 19, but boom, boom. This is 20. This is when COVID money first came out, 2020. This is really the time it was. 2020, 2021, COVID money starts to surge. Then May, then the drought in the summertime. Then the next COVID money surges, boom. And then we top out, that's Thanksgiving last year, 2021. And then we go with a 2022 slide down, okay? So I say ball pythons are not riding this curve quite as drastically as Bitcoin is. But it's definitely right up in here. And why do I say this? Because why? what in the world do they have in common? Ball pythons take a hell of a lot of work to make them, a lot of energy, a lot of steam, a lot of money. A lot of uh, a lot of all that shit. They take a lot to make, and uh, and and then you got to go sell them, and you sell them based on human emotion. You sell them based on what people like, what people want, where they're putting their money. Am I getting put in a clown? Is it going to go in puzzle? Is it going to go here? Is it going to go there? That's exactly what you're doing when you do that. Okay, so I, I mean, I don't see that it's that basically that crazy of an idea to uh, compare ball pythons to Bitcoin when we're looking at the way things are right now. Do I believe the recession talk? Fucking right, I believe the recession talk because you don't need a ball python to live. A ball python's not keeping you warm in an Arctic blast. And at the end of the day, a ball python is as good as it is for meat if we run into a fucking, uh, I don't know, walking dead type world. All right, ideal ball python projects for you personally. Um, hang on. I like the fact that BJ's podcast that this was supposed to be on is predominantly ball python and then arboreal stuff. Does a ton of shit on tree snakes. I don't know what that has relation to ball python. And then uh, gets me in an interview after 30, almost 30 years of fucking with this industry. Gets me in an interview and wants to focus on ball pythons and wants to say that I might have caused damage to the ball python community. I'm not really sure what he means by that. Um, I'm not really sure why, because exotics by nature did do a lot with ball pythons, but I also did a ton with corn snakes. I did a ton with boas. Um, I did some stuff with geckos, uh, early on, um, especially odd geckos that are still odd geckos now, like giant frog eyes and things like that. Uh, I have friends that transcend ball pythons on very many levels in this business. And I don't mean to say that in a bad way or a condescending way, just to say that when you're in the ball python frame of mind, you might not exactly be experiencing all of the reptile world and what we and what we have to offer. You know, exotics by nature wasn't named Sean Bradley reptiles. It wasn't named Bradley reptiles. It wasn't named North Shore reptiles, even though I'm on the predominantly known North Shore of Louisiana. Um, you, you know, it's uh, it's it's not something that I wanted a nomer. I, I didn't want to classify myself as a ball python or a reptile guy. I wanted to be able to do plants if I wanted to do exotic plants or 
fuck if I wanted to sell if I wanted to do strippers and and, and like sell fucking promises to uh what uh what do you call it nowadays uh fucking escort services right I could totally do that shit I mean look you want to out call stripper service and listen all about it then go listen to the Mark Petros interview I think I called it uh dancer to deed master and dude Mark's a great old friend of mine great snake breeder wonderful guy but he was a male dancer and he ran a dance business him and his wife ran an out call dance business so, you know, go listen to that podcast. It was a great one. Go on Spotify, Apple, iTunes, any of those, and just look up ball shit without the I. Just leave the I and the exclamation point out. Just type in B-A-L-L-S-H or put in the exclamation point. It should come right up. And pull up the old episodes of this shit, and you'll see exactly who I am when I showed my ass, right? But when I showed my ass, I was going through a lot of really bad, bad times, guys. So I really want you to excuse that. But at the same time... It's, uh, you know, it's uh, to be expected. God, I'm looking so terribly depressed at my crypto balance. Oh, oh my God. I lost so much money today. Oh, it hurt so bad. Oh, oh yeah, so it was bad. It hurt a lot. So I hope that the rest of my day isn't indicative of that fucking event because that was really miserable. Okay, guys. So I hope the rest of today is a great fucking day. So let's talk about this. Let's see. Oh, uh, let's see. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say sorry for being paused for a minute there while I try to catch my day up. All right. Ideal pri ball Python projects for you personally. This is where I'm like, dude, I really don't give a fuck. Okay. Puzzle is my thing. I named it. I marketed it from the day it started. The, the puzzle story is online. If you would love to know the puzzle story, simply go to youtube.com. Um, this is going to, like, I don't know what the hell is going to pop up right now, but um, let's see. Go to youtube.com just type in uh puzzle ball python story there you go and it should there you go ebn presents the history of the puzzle so this is the actual episode if you want to call it that 16 minutes and 33 seconds of me telling the story of the puzzle i uploaded it october 27th of 2013 um, it was actually one of the most profitable uploads I ever made because the very next week I did like $35,000 in sales. I believe after this is when, um, most of, you know, will in Canada, um, will morose, most of, you know, will morose and will morose bought in after this video, Maki Goskowitz bought in after this video. And yeah, it was a very, it was a very profitable video that I made where I just li literally released a clip where I just explained it. So if you want to know the story, the true story of the history of the puzzle, please go to the puzzle story and listen to this recording. Um, back to this. So that would be my personal thing. Most hyped up all Python morph out there is clown, bro. Hands down clown because Justin's all over it. Justin's making a mint off of it as are many other people. I love clown. I've always loved clown, but at the same time, clown is beat yet. It still continues to produce amazing, outstanding stuff. So congratulations to all of you who are producing fantastic, outstanding clowns and putting zeros behind them and getting it. I'm very happy for you. I'm not even the slightest bit sad. Uh, for you is getting into ball pythons right now bad or a good idea i would say that it is probably a good idea if you're smart about what you buy how much you pay and uh, who you listen to but do come on the scene very quietly don't come on the scene very loud if you're thinking about coming in don't come in with a flaming hot potato and money falling out of your pockets please don't come in with some sense about you be calm cool collected look for deals and see what we can see all right so what is your current overall goal in the ball python market today okay my our current overall goal in the ball python market today is probably just to bring you guys the history of ball pythons and to chop up the morph market list all right it is my plans to do a show with a co-host who i have hopefully gotten picked out by now and uh, it's all figured out that we will start after the new year. I hope that it all works out. We, we've discussed it. I've got two co-hosts, actually, one in part-time, either one. Uh, but it helps to have someone else there to buffer the old Sean, right? I mean, because, I mean, honestly, uh, the old me is still, um, the old me is still alive and well in the old podcasts. 
there are people that are still very cautious about doing talks with me and things like that on podcasts um, only because of the way I flamed out in 2018. Uh, and, and honestly, that's really it. I mean, uh, my current goal is just to really be here and be cognizant, be present for you guys and be respectful, be all of the things I was before and all of the things I wasn't before. That would be ultimately my goal here. Um, we'd be coming back in a capacity of a much stronger me uh, because I have had time to think and reflect and I have smoked up a quarter million dollars of my money in my fish store business. <laughs> so my overall, my overall goal is, well, this is part of it. Ball shit's part of it. The green screen behind me, the camera in front of me, the lights that are shining on my face. This is all part of the things I want to do. Okay. This is the stuff I want to do. This is not, I'm not here to, um, this is not my last resort. This is not, uh, you know, I've got these machines in here sitting cold. I could be working on them, making shit for craft shows and stuff. I don't need to be worrying about this shit, but at the same time, what I'm doing, I feel is valuable. Okay. So my current goal in the ball Python market today is to be here with ball shit to maybe sell some fucking t-shirts. I've got a few ball Python projects next door. A few of my friends have sent me some puzzle stuff that's very nice of them because they know how bad off my projects are, you know. And that's the part that he skipped over in his questioning that I don't really know uh, that we'll have to get to here in a minute. But I want to continue doing his questioning before I discuss my my next business goals uh, and things like that. All right, so that's my goal in the ball python market today. And now his now BJ's big thing was uh, did Sean Bradley cause damage to the ball python community? I don't see why the fuck this line would even be in my namesake. I spent more time on forums. I was a moderator of the kingsnake.com chat rooms for years. I was one that sat up in the chat rooms in 1997 when kingsnake.com was started and hosted that chat and got to know some amazing people. I know I know people that are on the fucking discovery channel because I moderated the chat room for King Snake when I was 18, 17, 18 years old. So I don't think I did damage to the ball python community at all. If anything, I did tremendous work to help you guys understand things more, tell you more about ultrasounding when nobody would tell me. I helped you guys save eggs. If you remember, I even posted it. If you look on the ball shit Instagram page uh, from earlier this year, I, I was one of the posts I used leading up to this show coming back was, a recollection of a pinstripe that was $20,000 that I saved with liquid fucking band-aid. You know, when nobody was talking about foot powder, nobody was talking about glue band-aid liquid band-aid. None of that shit was even on the menu. You know, the guys that were doing it, were keeping it quiet. I bought an ultrasound machine and nobody would help me figure it out. A week and a half later, I wrote a whole list on King snake of here's how you do an ultrasound. And one of the guys that wouldn't help me figure it out goes on the thread and says, man, Sean, you've learned a lot in a week and a half. And I said, you better fucking right. You better believe your ass. I learned a lot in a week and a half. You know what I did with that ultrasound do? And then people wouldn't tell me what to do. I called my friend, Dr. Mark Mitchell, and you can hear a podcast from him from on this very channel. If you're on this very channel, you'll hear a podcast from him on this very channel. So there you go. Um, so yeah, did I cause damage to the ball Python community? To be totally honest with you, I think that statement is absolutely motherfucking laughable. I think it's insulting. I think to use it as a tagline in a video is absolute clickbait garbage. I think if you wanted clickbait, that's fine, but I didn't know you were the National Enquirer. That should never have been your clickbait. And that was his clickbait was did Sean Bradley cause? And it was who, who is Sean Bradley and the damage he caused to the ball Python community? This is where you have, you want to know what it looks like right now. This is what you want. This is what disrespect looks like. And this is what brings me this video. It's the only thing I'm telling you guys. This is what brings me this video. I'm on my other channel, by the way. I'm on, uh, I'm on my. Day. Crap dog. DJ blowjob. Look at a fucking graphic. He changed the graphic to this shit here. And look. People aren't even ready. Look, y'all are all in the chat right here when you can come right over here in a little bit. And that, that's it. You know, I mean, that's how it goes. So we're going to see what it's all about tonight. It's going to be a fucking show for show. I mean, a show for show. <laughs> for show, for show. So yeah, back to it. This is where you have your moment to explain anything you aren't too proud of. Tell you what. But also, this is your time to explain anything you need to. 
I'd rather we not drop specific names, but I understand if we have to. If it's someone we both don't like, I think we shouldn't mention their name, but honestly, do what you please. This is your episode. All right. Let's stand on this for a minute. This is my chance to explain what I'm not proud of. If you're listening to this, you might go back and listen to the old shit. When you listen to the old shit, I went after BHB for not saying a word about the scaleless ball python after I'd already invested in it, thinking that the words would come out, thinking I would see something, thinking I would see evidence of the animal moving around and being healthy and being viable, thinking that my investor that paid $50,000 for us to get a scaleless head spent his money wisely. And you know what I found? Not a goddamn word. So I poked the bear. And the bear released a video the very next, like two days later or a day later, they released a video from afar, a choppy video of the scaleless ball python crawling on the carpet in their house. And I'm like, why is it in your house? Why is it on the facility? Why is it, why is it at home in special care? What's its special needs like, you know? Oh no, it's no problem. It's totally viable. They're totally good. Everything's great. Totally good. Everything's great. And now you can go and watch a podcast with him say live honestly in the in the video on his own channels say that it's not a viable project and that it isn't good and that it's not worth people keeping as pets because it's so hard to keep and blah 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 you hear him say a lot of that on that show so it's really sad that that's really where where we went wrong but you know that's where i went out out of shape and went out of style because you know what some of that stuff might have been deserved but the rest of it might not have been okay um, I'd like to take this time to apologize to Mike Wilbanks' current wife. I didn't think he would be her current wife. He he would she would be his current wife, but I will make a personal apology to them on my own, on my own time, where it matters, when it matters. This shouldn't count as that apology, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Let me bear all and say I'm not proud of how I treated that lady. Okay. All right. Uh, next on, uh, yeah, there were some friends that the reason that BJ has these, uh, various opinions of me and, and all this is that, uh, two of his friends tried to buy all my puzzle ball, three of his friends tried to buy all my puzzle ball pythons. One of them, I truly believe was innocent in the entire thing and was just a name and an, and a bank account. And by that, he knows who he's talking, who I'm talking about. If he listens to this, if he hears this part, he'll know. Of the three of you that tried to buy the Puzzle Ball Pythons, you were the most honorable one that I don't believe knew what the other two were trying to do. Possibly the other one was trying to do. Maybe the uh, maybe two of you were innocent, but I know, in fact, one of you was. And I do still honor you, sir. I do still honor you. Not in business. I don't want your money. I would like your friendship. And, I, and he knows who he is, and I might direct him to this very soundbite at some point in time but I will not mention his name. The other two, they know who they are. Uh, They know what they did. They know they tried to cut me in half on a day that I needed them. Uh, They tried to half their offer in my need when I really didn't need. I just made myself seem like I needed to see what they would do. And that's what they did. And, uh, and that I think is where BJ gets most of his opinion of me. And that's very sad because I think we could have done a really great show but I think this rolls so much faster and easier without any interjection. Because after all, who the fuck is Sean Bradley? I'm me. Who knows me better than me? Who could tell my story better than me? Especially if I'm as narcissistic as my mom tells me I am. (laughs) My favorite subject is myself. So let's not roll. Let's, Let's keep rolling into it. All right, here we go. At this point, I don't really have anything else to say, bro. Like, I I mean, I'm sorry to Tim Bailey because our friendship was put in jeopardy over some dumb shit I did. I tried to make up for it. Tim gave me the opportunity. I squandered that opportunity. I shit on that opportunity because I wasn't ready for the opportunity yet. If he gave it to me now, it'd be a different story. But I think that ship has sailed. If it's permanently done, it's permanently done. But if it's not, I'd fucking love to know more about it, but I got to be a talky talky. I'm a talky talky touchy touchy. I like to hug my people. I like to do my fist bumps and my handshakes and my hugs and shit. I'm me. I'm a Scorpio. I'm sexual like that. I'm sensual, right? I'm touchy touchy. So I need to be like all up in you, right? Like that needs to be our friendship. We need to be like no violations, bro. 
No homo. That's fine. You'd be no homo. No homo's fine. But no violations. No like, oh, I'm offended. None of that. Like, I'm going to tell you how it is because you're my boy. You're my best fucking boy. And you know what? We just couldn't work it out. So there it is. I, ho I hope one day we work it out before we're dead. I hope we work it out. Okay. That's it. Brian, I, that, I, he also sold me five grand worth of heads that didn't prove out. So you want to reparate that? Then give me five grand. Let's start there. Uh, and otherwise just move on because I don't think I damaged the fucking thing. I left and I said, fuck you guys and what you're stand for on my way out. And then I came back and I saw like little guys grow up and be bigger guys. And I was like, oh, wow, y'all actually have a chance underneath the, the giant JK, the giant shadow of JK. You have a chance. And I, I love it. I think it's great. And I see him doing more and I see genetic testing and I see morph market uh, thriving. And I see many cocoa brands, not just rev the chip. And like all of it is good. All of it is good things. Good things. Good things. Why do I need to fucking come back to this shit? I don't need to come back to this shit. Do I guys? I don't. This is my answer to coming back to this shit. A one-sided view from me, about me. That's it. So did I cause damage? No fucking way I caused damage. Ask anybody around, go to a reptile show and be like, did Sean cause damage? Be like, no, he's an asshole. He's in a wheelchair. I don't think he caused any damage. You know, I mean, I raised a 50 gra over 50 grand for US ARC. I raised in a short order, a few years. You know, that's not bad for one guy to raise $50,000. I mean, that's a lot of money thousand dollars you know i thought it was worth effort i thought it was worth saying worth talking about all right now this is the next question us arc open format how can we all help and make a difference people who don't believe in us arc let's talk about that without dropping names honestly bro i don't know who doesn't believe in us arc and i don't care because i believe in us arc hang on i need this for this Oh, I'm going to pour my other drink. Get ready for my next show that's coming up. Y'all ain't even ready for all this shit. Y'all ain't even ready for all of this shit. No. Mm-hmm. All right. So here we go. Pour my drink. Having my drink. My drink of choice right here. This is my drug. Diet Coke. I didn't put anything in it. I should have opened it on camera so nobody can say he put meth in it before. Can you believe that motherfucker texted me and said I was I used meth before? I went to private school, motherfucker. I mean, I know there's a lot of private school shitheads, right? <laughs> a lot of fucking crackheads went to private school. I went to Harvard and I did tons of coke. <laughs> I have smoked weed. I have eaten weed. I've licked weed. I've drank weed. And alcohol, a little, not a lot. Didn't start drinking until I was 29 years old. Never got drunk, really, until I met my kid's mom, because she's a fucking drunk, so she rubbed off codependency and all. So I drank with her a little bit. And fuck, fuck that. Fuck throwing up in the shower and shit. Fuck that. That ain't no way to live. I'll go to a reptile show and drink one drink, and I'll nurse that motherfucker all night. You'll see. I won't be sloppy. You'll never see me sloppy ever and that's one i want to talk about us arc open format how can we all help and make a difference how about this carry yourself like a motherfucking professional how about that if you're gonna fly this flag up here on top of your screen like i'm pointing out with this cursor over here you know if you're gonna fly this us arc flag that guy if you're gonna fly that guy have some fucking pride you know what i mean I mean, really, have some fucking pride. I mean, you're going to preach about people doing all this stuff. At least have pride in the people that are doing good. Have pride in yourself. Fuck. People don't believe in U.S. Arc. I mean, honestly, bro, I don't know who that is. I don't know who I'm going to drop names on. Fuck, I might as well. I might talk to one of them tonight. I'm not really sure. But I know one thing. You ain't going to talk about U.S. Arc and helping them and making a difference the way you're running your fucking mouth these days. So do me a solid and uh, do what I've done for US Arc. Shut the fuck up and earn, dude. Donate some shit. Hatch out a $5,000 snake and donate it. I did. One, two, three, four times. Four fucking times. 
<laughs> Fuck you, dude. Four times. I just five grand. Here you go. Pair pair of hats. Here you go. Pair of this. Here you go. Five grand. Give it five grand. Every time you go to a show, give 10% of what you made on a Saturday to US Arc at the auction, and I will love you forever. And you'll have a bunch of cool shit. You'll have all kind of painted rocks. Look, you'll have you'll have fucking You'll have Mata Mata rocks. Look at I kind of grabbed this to the green screen, wouldn't pull it off. You'll have a Mata Mata rock. You'll have a you'll have a personal a personal friendship with people like Todd Goodman who sit up there and spend ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars every fucking show to keep your goddamn industry afloat. Yeah, get your ass in there and spend that money. And if you've been doing that, thank you for doing that. Thank you, thank you very much for doing that. If you've been doing everything you can do for them, thank you. I have not been doing everything I can do for US Arc. I have not been. I have been twice a week chanting it and showing the logo and stuff like that. But I'm going to start making these signs, bro. This is all, all of these things are all the fucking, mo all the, all the push I need, all the, all the, the motivation I need to get myself going with things like US Arc making these signs to make a difference, right? So you'll see. What I can do for US Arc. What can you do for US Arc? Every fucking thing you can. That's what you can do for US Arc. Wrap up question. What is Sean Bradley's overall goal in the reptile industry today now that you're back? I I pretty much answered that with the current goal in the ball python market up today up there. And I'm gonna say this like straight up, no bullshit. No fucking bullshit. My overall goal to come back is to make this better myself better the industry better you a better herper a better breeder a better business person a better podcaster i'm here for better that's why i'm fucking here so if that's a wrap-up question then it's truly a wrap-up question i'm gonna give this dude a little bit of credit here hot seat questions i don't know what the fuck this is and to be totally honest with you I do not know what else he had in store for me. An hour and seven minutes. That's my entire history in an hour and seven minutes. I don't really know what else I could tell you other than, yeah, in 2015, I decided to do ball shit and stuff like that, right? But I want to also bring your attention to this, okay? On this outline, signed with Merry Christmas, BJ, your biggest fan, yeah. Yeah, I wrote that, guys. He didn't write that. I fucking wrote that. Yesterday was something else, but the past is the past, so let's seriously make the best out of this show and go into 2023 on a solid note. Call or text me if you need anything. I'm going to tell you right now, when he sent this email, it was Christmas morning. It was the day after he acted a complete fool and totally insulted me, telling me that I had been a meth addict, that I smelled <laughs> like I smelled. Um, all of this, like if, if, if you really want to address me and have me on your show, I will come on your show. I would love to be on your show. If you are anyone, I don't care if you are hosting a show on toilet paper and my kind of shit is what shit you want to talk about. Have me on. I, I'm totally into it. But when you invite me on your show, do not do some stupid shit like this. This is fucking atrocious. Did he do damage to the ball python community? Mind you, the other day, my photo was here. And this read, and the damage he did to the ball python community. I know a lot of you. And some of you I personally wronged. I'm not going to lie to you guys when I tell you, I, for the life of me, Cannot think of one fucking thing I did that would have damaged the community, that wouldn't have helped the community, unified the community, and all that stuff. There's that creaky fucking door again. <laughs> Grace coming and going. All right, Grace. You heading home? See you later. All right. And that's Grace, the girl that helps me run exotics by nature. No, we don't fuck. There you go. More bullshit transparency. No, we don't fuck. I've known the girl since she was six years old. She was a client in my store. She's a friend of mine. She's a great employee. She's worked for me for five years. And I've never seen her naked. Not one photo of her. Can't say that about other employees I've had in the past. 
but I can definitely say that about the one I've had for the last five years because I've been on a five-year track of getting better with my life. So he said that, you know, yesterday was something else, past is the past, and then he continued to go on and act like an ass. So, you know, I'm going to say this to you right now. I went and wrote this. I wrote, if you plan to keep this outline and do it with taste, I'm fine. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Tell me if we could stick to this outline. I will trust in this here, but I have a bad feeling about this since you asked me. And then, you know what? This was never answered. To this moment right now, this was never answered. Till 8 p.m. Central Time, 6 p.m. Pacific, when the show airs tonight, this was not answered. And that, to me, is an absolute, is just, uh, just fucking insane. It's absolutely insane. I, I don't know what else to say other than fuck it. It's nuts um, to, to say that, you know, like I would, I'm, I'm not going to do that show. I, I did it all here. Like I said, this, my new show is seriously positive and serious. I don't need to go down a different path. I don't need to head down that path. I don't need to play ball in that court. <laughs> I don't need to ball down that lane. You feel me? Like I'm going to keep saying these things and the, none of them are going to make my point even stronger. If you wanted to know who the fuck Sean Bradley was, I just gave it to you in an hour and 11 minutes. If you have any questions, you know, oh yeah, like, um, like, let me just d dive into the fish store thing. In 2018, I was very upset. I didn't like the way my life was. I didn't like the way the industry was going. I didn't like the way my collection was. I thought my collection was old and stagnant. And then in 2019, I met, or in 2018, I met a guy named David and David decided to make the offer to me that if I wanted to quit breeding ball pythons and own an aquarium store instead, that he would help me with the build of the store and he would do it all. And he would not ask me for any money and he would bust his ass for months and help me do it. And I said, wow, this is an opportunity of a lifetime. So I did what I could and I unbolted the major projects like mahogany puzzle uh, albino pied, um, clown. And I sold off all, I unbuckled all the big projects that I had and I sold them off as individual projects, opened my aquarium store in, um, in March of 2019 is when we signed the lease. We opened in June of 19, uh, did a, a did a coasted into a decent six months of business when COVID hit definitely took off with business because everybody loved everything in COVID. We had a great time making money during COVID. Um, I had a great experience with a few employees. I had a great experience with a bunch of customers. Uh, it was very hard on me after a while. It was very hard on my family. It was very hard on my body being that I, you know, I am a, well, we didn't touch on that either. I am a T8 paraplegic. <laughs> um, I mean, there's a lot of rich things about me. I should say rich details, not rich like they're valuable, but like in depth details about me guys. And, and that's the thing. I completely left that out because that's how much my body, my, my situation doesn't bother me. Okay. I am a T8 paraplegic from the chest down. I am completely dead from the chest down in the year 2012. I fell backwards uh, off my deck after there was no railing. I was leaning against a post talking to my grandmother on the phone. Her birthday is July 4th. I just told you I didn't drink. I was not drinking at the time. I had smoked a little weed, but I was a daily smoker at the time. So I don't think weed did it, but it could have. You can blame that on it. Who knows? But I did slip and fall off of the deck and uh, right outside this door, right outside this window. I mean, I slipped off of a deck 12 feet up in the air backwards. I landed on the flats of my shoulders here and I broke across the chest at the sternum. Uh, a complete break, a complete break. Um, and, and at that point I was already breeding snakes from home. I wasn't running a store. Uh, and that was in 2012 and I, and my daughter was born in 2013 in January of 13. And in 2000, by, by, by the summer of 2013, okay. I was injured in 2012. Um, uh, by the in July of 2012, I was discharged from physical rehab hospital in September of 2012. And I went on to be driving a car by April of 2013 and back to work, like back to work fully downstairs, working on the snakes and stuff uh, in, in the beginning of 2013, before my daughter was born, right before 
she was born in early January. I went back to work and then I, I was driving with hand controls by April and by May and June, I was boarding planes and flying around the country doing reptile shows and doing family function, functional things. Nothing has stopped me. I'll back up. But I'll show you. I am functionally confined to a wheelchair. Um, here's my wheelchair from the back. Here's my handle. Yep. There you go. I am, uh, you know, like I said, I T8 complete. That's chest level. That's sternum high level right here. Not waist. I'm not waist level broken, guys. I'm actually broken at the chest. That's why I can't do a lot of lifting and I can't bend over and I have such a gut and stuff now because my back has broken down. My spine has broken down. All my discs have crunched and I've gotten just exponentially shorter and fatter because all my, I mean, I'm fat, but I am overweight. I am overweight, but I, but it's not all weight. A lot of it's just from the settling, if you want to call it that. So, um, so yeah, just want to wrap this up here quickly. Cause I'm going to get this up online, but, uh, but yeah, so, uh, I jumped around here at the very end. I can't believe I left out my paralysis being such a large part of my life, but it had nothing to do with his questioning. He didn't even care so much that I was in a wheelchair. He didn't really care so much that I went for, I came from hell and back and basically ran everything as champ as I could run it. And, uh, and honestly, bro, I'm happy. All of you guys, I'm happy for all of your support all of your love, the industry raised money for me. Another reason why I so can selflessly give back to us arc and stuff, because you guys gave so selflessly to me and my family. I have a home still because of you. I have my daughter in my life because of you. I mean, I have all of these things to thank the, co the, the, the public of reptiles for why do I need to stain things with negativity? And so that's why I really truly hope you will accept this as my version of who the fuck is Sean Bradley. And honestly, I don't really have much more to give you, right? Like, I mean, I did lose a child too. I mean, but again, please go listen to the Chris Eaton episode. Okay. Of the ball shit podcast. I would really appreciate that. If you guys would get, would get that going, um, is go over to the, go over to the Chris Eaton episode it's on the ball shit channel. I'm going to try to get to that now. Um, let me see here. Bum, 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 bum. Let's see. Ball shit. Go to my channel, live streams. All right. Get me in the window in the bottom corner. All right, here we go. So, um, yeah, you guys need to just go in here and check out a bunch of these episodes. Really? We've done just some killer stuff. These folks and I have just thrown down just awesome, awesome shit. I mean, just absolutely incredible shit. But if you scroll back almost to the beginning to the one that was listened to the most, the ball shit episode one with, uh, with Chris Eaton and I'm going to be straight with you guys. Okay. That Chris and I had come down to a little bit of a disagreement over some stuff, but that I hope we're working on things now. And uh, and I love him, and I have always loved him, and I and I will always love him. He's a, been a brother to me, and he, he in a lot of areas he is far superior to me, and in a lot of areas, and I'm also superior to him. I think we complement each other very nice. And one of our one of our regular routine listeners said something that was amazing. He said. I really think that uh, that you guys need to make it up because you guys are in a fraternity that no one else can join. And I thought, wow, that was a really cool way of putting it was that we were in a fraternity that no one else could join. You know, what a way of putting that. So thank you very much to, uh, I believe, Shane Kelly, who, uh, no, not with Shane Kelly. That was, um, that was, uh, that was Brian. That was pin hat guy, pin hat guy. So yeah, go back to bullshit episode one and hear a little bit more about me. If you're just not sick of hearing about me, because honestly, I'm sick of hearing about me. And on that note, I'm going to thank a bunch of people that have gotten me to this point. Okay. I mean, look, I'm going to thank these sponsors because they might not be my sponsors when this video just keeps going, right? Some of them might not be sponsors anymore, but I hope when you're not my sponsor, because I haven't lost any sponsors yet. I hope when you're not my sponsor anymore, that you're not my sponsor because of, uh, of moving on to bigger and better things or that you don't need me anymore or that you want to make a spot for somebody else to uh, have all the benefit of what my wonderful wisdom and words can bring them. I really don't know. I hate to lose any of you as sponsors, but first of all, 
Morph Market. John, you didn't have to take me back, baby. You took me back and I love you for it. And I hope you're fine with all that's transpired today in this week. All right. Sea serpents. I know you got my back, bro. You've been my bro forever. Tell you what. That's not true. You got my back. You've been my bro since my back broke. And for that, I love you. You kept me alive. You have no idea with your words, donations, sponsorships, friendship, brotherhood, hugs, overall exuberance. Just you being you, motherfucker. You are awesome. Chris Nettles at Sea Serpents. Debbie Price, reptiles to you. Debs, I've known you forever, ever. I've known you forever, ever. And I didn't start shipping with you until my shipper pissed me off. And I'm never going to stop shipping with you until you piss me off. And I don't see you ever pissing me off, chick. So thank you very much for being a sponsor and a friend of the Ballshit Podcast. I love you very much. Look here. I'm going to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this easier. Before I start crying. Oh, why well, I do my dedication roll. I'd like to thank all of these people, right? Like there was an old Snake Bites episode where he voted for the five best tables in the Arlington show. And Celia and I won number one spot. Now you can't see it now. He deleted it now. He deleted all the first seasons of Snake Bites because of all the live feedings and the bad quality and stuff. That show, the sound quality was terrible because his camera guy fucked up. But it was the top five tables in the show. And we not we got number one, me and Celia. And they said, what do you have to say for yourself? And I used the Vince Vaughn line. I don't remember what movie it was. And I said, I'd like to thank God, my mom, and everyone who lost. And Celia said, oh, geez. And Brian cut the video, you know. But really, I like to, I really want to thank these guys. So bring them up on this screen right now on this side. I want, like, I'm looking at this screen, but they're on that side of my screen. So it's really fucked up. There. Much more better. Switch screens to the other side. There you go. Much, much more better. All right. <laughs> okay. So here we got, let's see. Uh, not going to put that up. That's good. All right. So we can look at these sponsors over here on the side. Okay. Reptiles to you. Sea Serpents, Morph Market. You just got teary eyed over you three. Bravo Zulu. Thank you very much. Thank you for your service. Thank you for being you. Eileen, you're a motherfucking badass. Thank you very much. Ectothermic Jungle, Jim LaValle, the next one down, the red one with the shield and the swords. I don't know you super, super good, Jim, but you've always been one to hit me up in the private chats, and you always seem to ally your opinions with mine, so thank you for sponsoring my views. Infinite Possible Pythons, you can see his ass on, uh, here, hold on a second. You can see his ass on, on uh, stop screen, present screen, share screen, this screen, that screen. Whew. You can see him over here on uh, on our channel. So we're looking at old BJ over there. You can see him right here. Nathan Granoff, Infinite Possible Pythons. He just did a show with me Tuesday night. The Ballshit Podcast on the Ballshit Channel. There we are. Live Tuesday night. Go check him out. Thank you very much, Nathan, for being a sponsor of the Ballshit Podcast currently. Mad River. John, I ain't heard much out of you this week, bro. I hope you're good with all this shit. Mad River right over there. I love you to death. That guy right there with the blue seal. Go check him out on Instagram. He's always putting up fun posts on Instagram. Steve Beamer, Reptile Collective. The one next down from that, the RC with the circle around it. Reptile Collective. Steve Beamer. Boy, Steve and I go back. I'd love to have Steve on this show soon. We talk about how far back we go. Oh, Steve-o. Steve-o and I go back far. Oh, the beneath them, the savages. Oh, the savages. The savages are like, the, the, if they open their marriage, I'm coming in. That's all I'm saying. That's all I got to say about that. Becca, I love you. I fell in love with you when we talked ages ago. Everybody watches the show knows about us right at this point. Ricky, I love that you made an honest woman out of her, or however that saying goes. Uh, she does have horses, so that's your cross to bear, not mine. That's not the reason I bowed out, but ultimately we joke about that being the reason why, or at least I do <laughs> save face that I had fucked up and didn't have a wonderful woman in my life to run reptiles with, but she's amazing. So treat her right. Uh, Becca and Ricky Savage, the Florida Lee with the snake wrapped around. It. He's a tattoo artist. If that explains the 
symbol at all. Uh, Small Town Exotics, STX. There you go. Small Town Exotics. Uh, not to be confused with FTX, STX, <laughs> worth investing in STX, small down exotics. Uh, Shane Kelly has been a great supporter of this podcast, and I super appreciate you, and especially your sobriety and, and all that you do to, uh, to, to basically show us what a real man can be. I think that's wonderful. And then finally, Josh Strange, sorry to have you there at the bottom, but it's alphabetical, bro. I don't mean anything by it. You're, not, you're right down there on the, on the, on the very bottom. And uh, I'll be honest, dude, this guy, he, he, he suffered a brain injury when he was a kid. So he's quiet, but he's smart and he, and he's always around and he's tactful and he knows who to support. If you want to see more about Josh strange, uh, go check out snakes and a fat man. He's then done a new, where are they now show on Josh strange. And uh, you can see what's up with Josh on that show. Although I think Chris probably threw a couple of shots in there at him, but that's okay. It's fair game, right? I mean, I think at this point he kind of likes it, but uh, you know, let me just say that without this group of people, I wouldn't bring you ball shit. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bring you guys the, the level of production that I bring you now. I wouldn't have the, the, the time to, fuck around with uploading stuff to audio and all of this. I, I just wouldn't be able to do it without them. So please check out their businesses. All of them are worthy. I give them all my endorsement and uh, I'm going to wrap this up at an hour and 30 minutes of a monologue. I always said I wasn't going to do too much monologuing. I hated doing it here. I would have loved to have had this interview with someone that was a grown up that could have brought their a game to the table could have had a good show with me and just really been all in all there to uh, to have fun, to have a good time, to bring the industry forward and not set us back any. And honestly, I'm, I'm done with the setbacks, guys. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Who is Sean Bradley? And um, that's it. That's what I have to say. If any of you have any questions, hit me up on the DMs, the PMs, the IMs, and the OMs, whatever. And uh, I'll be happy to answer anything you have to say. I mean, please let me know what you have to say. We need to talk. If you have a beef and I don't know about it, we should talk. Um, there's a few people, like I said, <laughs> Will Banks' wife. I don't even know her name. This isn't a real apology. If it was a real apology, I'd have gone and found her name. But no, this isn't a real apology. I'll do that when I can find the right way to do it. Because doing it on a podcast in front of everybody is not an apology. That's fucking, st that's stature, that's stance, that's fucking advertising, it's bullshit, it's not heartfelt, it's not, it doesn't mean anything, I would not take this as an apology from anyone, okay, so yeah, I hope I answered the questions, I'm pretty sure I fucking did though, I'm pretty sure I fucking did all of them, didn't I, did I, did I, did I leave anything behind over here, I mean, I don't really know, you guys tell me in the comments on this episode, if I left anything behind, but I am going to tell you right now, I'm clicking out of here to go over and to do something special, something very special. You all know about it by the time you watch this much of this production. Okay. And I love the fact that Kevin McCurley and I are about to do a live show in place of a bunch of bullshit. So enjoy it. Whether you want to watch who I am or who he is, either one, you'll have it. Good luck and good night. I do actually care about you all. I do. I care about this business and I care about my future and I care about your future. I do. I just wish that some people didn't show their fucking ass. That's it. That's all I got. I'm out of here. <laughs>I care so much about the information. I don't even fill in the two black boxes there to make it a real video for YouTube so you can click it. Uh, really? That's it. An hour and 30 minutes, almost on the motherfucking nail. All right? 30 seconds to go.